So the four marks of the church. One, you know, we say it in the creed, right? Nicene Creed. But I, I'm going to share with you, I think, that there are many Catholics who don't fully get this. Something so basic. Uh, and of these marks, which do you think would be the most difficult, perhaps, for Catholics to fully understand and appreciate? One. Okay. So some people say one. Holy. Holy. You know, and this is my bias. I think it's apostolic because, and here's why, because if we fully understood this, we would understand how this, the apostolic nature speaks to each one of these. And we'd fully appreciate it. And we'd have a better understanding. So I'm going to, that's what, that's what I'm going to try to do tonight, is to help you get that, I hope. Um, so we start out, and what I've done is I pulled from the catechism. Now, how many of you have a catechism? Okay. Some of the inquirers do. All right, that's good. Um, there is an abridged version, by the way. I would recommend you get the full version. Um, it's not something that you necessarily want to read through. I, I've actually done that, you know. <laughs> And it was a chore. I mean, I'll admit that. But it's just chock full of information that I will go through. And whenever I'm giving a teaching, I'll look to the catechism. And because if you look, the references are huge. And the references will reference church fathers, will reference previous documents and teachings of the church, and will reference scripture. And a lot of times I'll just go to the catechism and look at the list in terms of, uh, what are key scriptures to pick out? You know, there are tools online to search the Bible to pull those up, but um, it's not that easy sometimes. And so here's this nice little list. Nick, you wanted to say something? Not anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. And then I've given you scriptures, and I've tried to lead with the gospel. What did Jesus say? And then what did Paul say? And then there, there are some of the other letters. But, you know, frankly, Paul is the apostle that God used for most of us to be here today. <laughs> um, you know, frankly, some of the, you know, the other apostles went to different places. But it was Paul who spoke to who? Who was his primary mission? The Gentiles. Because, you know, historically it's important. Is, you know, we could trace... The church all the way back. All these aspects and marks of the church go all the way back to the very beginning. Back to the apostles who walked and talked with Jesus. And we, and we could trace it out historically. Um, hopefully before we'll take a break and I'm going to go get something to help illustrate that for you. Um, but throughout history, our understanding of what these, this means developed. And Paul was key to that because he, what happened early on is, remember what I said before, that the church was composed of Jews who understood Jesus to be the Messiah, but actually through time, that part of the church kind of died out, um, which is natural because the ones who converted, who got it, were in the church. And the rest of the Jews throughout history, there was only a smattering who converted. So where was the greatest population? <laughs> It was the Gentiles, and that's who Paul was sent to minister to. Um, and what a great success it was. We wouldn't be here today if that didn't happen. So, we could see in the Catechism, it is Christ who through the Holy Spirit makes his church one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And always, you know, people will sit there and criticize the church in terms of, well, you know, do you really believe in Jesus? <laughs> of course we do. I mean, the reason we're one holy and Catholic and apostolic is all because of Jesus. It's always about him and his person. Um, only faith can recognize, though, that the church possesses these properties from her divine source. It really does take faith 
because this isn't necessarily something you're going to accept logically, although Jesus does state it pretty clearly. It is great and perpetual motive of credibility and irrefutable, irrefutable witness of her divine mission, the fact that this has continued from over 2,000 years, these marks. And so in the creed is basically is, you know, there were early struggles. I don't know how many of you know about the formation of the creed, and we'll, we'll do more about that, but is that as the church is going along, you know, the early church, gee, they knew Jesus. They had the apostles with them. But as the apostles died out, okay, we have the appointed bishops to carry it on. But then there are people who, well, what does this mean? What would, when Jesus said this, what does that mean? And the church has got to sort that out. Because remember, the church came before the written word. It was the spoken word that the church had, and it had the written word in terms of the Old Testament. But when it comes to the New Testament, it was the church that was there first. And the church had to decide, okay, which is from Jesus. And so the church is writing this down in terms of, well, what did Jesus say? What was important? And how do we understand that? And so there would be disputes and discussions. If you look early on, Peter and Paul had discussions. From very, well, what, what does this mean for us? You know, in terms of circumcision and the law, etc. And it was a pretty heated dispute. And, you know, the church doesn't deny that there was a dispute between them. Because truth was important. And they were both willing to fight for the truth. Um, so there was that struggle. But there was still this unity. Because of what was the source of that unity? Jesus. That's what brought them together. So there was always some diversity but there was always this oneness, too, that we see throughout history. So, in John we see, I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, and so that they may all be one, as you, Father, and I are in me, and I in you. Well, wow. I mean, think of that image. This is the Trinitarian God. You can't be more one than the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying the apostles and followers need to be one with Him just as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are. Wow. I mean, that's not, in, in, the, in the realm of our flesh, that's not possible. <laughs> it's only in the Spirit that that's possible. God can accomplish that. So that's God's work and Jesus' work. We have to say yes to it. So that's a pretty powerful image to have. And then in Romans, for as in one body we have many parts. So you see this idea of the oneness being one that comes from our unity with Christ. And you know, it's peculiar. Like, Father is married. He's married to the body of Christ. I'm married to a wife. But you know, when we all die and go to heaven, we're all married one with Christ. All of us. Seems kind of scary too, doesn't it? <laughs> but we will all be one. And so this image comes about with Paul and other writers in terms of, because Jesus used it himself in terms of the bride, the marriage. And there's two messages there, not only in terms of this oneness that comes about with marriage, but that's an example for us in terms of husbands and wives, in terms of how important marriage is and why the church says marriage is a sacrament. It's this idea of oneness that can be accomplished through Christ and that we are the bride of Christ, the body of Christ too. So there is a oneness, but look at us, you know, we're all diverse, different. And so we have this Oneness, one body, but we have different characteristics. And the image is good in the sense of some people are head, some people are hands, some people are feet, using that imagery. And Paul uses that a lot in terms of that imagery. But, you know, what's the hand without the heart or the hand without the feet? Hand's not going very far without the feet. So we're all important. We're all part of the body of Christ. We are one. 
And Paul goes on to say this is a great mystery. Now this scripture is Paul's talking about marriage in terms of husbands and wives. But then he goes on to say in that discussion, this is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. Again, the importance of this whole imagery of oneness in terms of marriage, Christ and the body, which is the church. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, with the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. But he's obviously not saying we're robots in that, you know, we don't think critically or whatever, but there is a oneness. And this is a tension. I use, you'll hear me say that a lot because people will talk about balance. Well, balance tends to imply to me, you, you know, put things on a scale and you balance and then you can go away and it stays there. Whereas tension implies if you don't work and keep it in balance, it won't stay there. You have to work at it. And that's part of our struggle as Christians is to maintain this oneness and yet allow for diversity. So there's a tension there in terms of in the body of Christ and what we do at Mass in terms of a oneness that occurs and yet diverse. And so you'll see in the church, we are still one. We're still Catholic. And if you go and study this, you'll see there's lots of different ways to celebrate Mass. But we're still the body of Christ, still the Catholic Church. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because the loaf of bread is one, the loaf of bread is one. We, though many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Again, Christ bringing us together. But one and the same Spirit produces all of these, distributing them individually to each person as He wishes. Again, this imagery of the body. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons. We were all given to drink of one Spirit. So Paul hits this in many ways. This imagery of oneness through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, through our consumption of Christ in the Eucharist. But they're all pointing to the fact that we are one. And you'll see in Revelations, Then I heard something like the sound of a great multitude, or the sound of rushing water, or mighty peals of thunder, as they said, Alleluia, the Lord has established His reign, our God the Almighty. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. So we see this in terms of the Lord it being Catholic in one sense because of His reign. For the wedding day of the Lamb has come. The wedding day of the, his bride has made herself ready. Christ being the lamb, the body of Christ, the holy ones, the saints, which we're going to get to, being his bride. <clears throat> now we see in the catechism, the church is one because of her source. Again, pointing to the love and the unity of, of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The church is one because of her soul, which is the Holy Spirit. What an astonishing ministry, mystery. There is one Father of the universe, one Logos. You know what that means? Word, truth. One Logos of the universe and also one Holy Spirit. Everywhere one and the same. There's also one virgin become mother, and I should like to call her church. From the beginning, though, as it says, there has been this diversity. And we see this in terms of, you know, like in a team, some, you know, in a sports team, it's not a great analogy, but it's something we can identify with. You got different players on the team. If they work together, the team does well, or does better, certainly, right? And we all have different gifts and abilities. And for the team, the church, to do well, we need to work together in unity for that to be accomplished. And the way that's accomplished is, again, we have to turn and put our gifts at the feet of the Holy Spirit in Jesus. We have to let the Holy Spirit guide us in the use of those. 
What are the bonds of unity? Profession of one faith received from the apostles, a common celebration of divine worship, especially the sacraments, and the apostolic succession through the sacrament of holy orders. And the, the catechism goes on to say that the church, constituted and organized as a society in the present world, subsists in the Catholic Church. And this is a word that theologians have debated about in terms of how to say this, um, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. And you know what the, the catechism is struggling is how do we say that the fullness, the, the real visible unity is in the visible Catholic Church without denying the fact that there are others who are Christian who are in some ways in union with us, imperfect. And of course, even within the church, we are in imperfect union because we're sinners. But the visible representative is of oneness is the Catholic Church on earth. And others who are in some way, every Christian is considered part of the Catholic Church. Now, obviously, some people would take issue with that and be very upset. But if you think about this, this is perfectly logical. You know, that's why the church says we need faith and reason. Because if we are one body, then we have to be one with each other. There can't be more than one bride. Jesus himself said that. There is only one. So everybody who is in union with Christ is a part of the body of Christ, and there can only be one body. So again, the church is always going to be consistent and logical. And you know, this was a struggle. Father brought this up in terms of Vatican II. Because the teaching had been, you know, that you can't be saved except through the church. The teaching didn't change, because that's still the case. Because how did we find out about Christ? Through the church, his followers, his believers. Um, but then they recognize, well, gee, there's a lot of pretty good, solid Christians out there who aren't in the Catholic Church. So they're obviously in union with Christ in some way. And so that's why the church changed a little bit in terms of, didn't change its theology, but in, recognize that they are part of the church. All of you are, if you have accepted Jesus as your Savior and baptized, you're part of the church. And there can even those who aren't baptized necessarily in terms of desire and intent. <coughs> Okay. Now we know there are, it goes on to talk about, specifically in the Catechism, that there, this unity has been damaged. And it was damaged from the very beginning. Even, even Paul had a you know, falling out, you know, with some of his cohorts, people working with him, you know. Um, but they reconciled later. So there can be disagreements, and so this is part of the mystery in terms of, we are one, but it's an imperfect oneness. And it won't be perfect until when? Until Jesus comes back. <clears throat> and we have to be careful with that. And I think one of the things that you need to go away with in terms of why this is important is each of these is each of us can be an instrument for unity. We can also be an instrument for disunity and division and that that's a challenge as we talk and relate to people and we go about our daily lives in terms of how we deal with these differences it's a real challenge especially I know I, I struggle with that because I, I'm so excited about being a Catholic and and my faith that I just want to share it with other people and but I don't want to be obnoxious either about it you know <laughs> And so if you find that, just tell me. <laughs> it's okay. I can handle it. Certain things are required in order to respond adequately to this call for unity. A permanent renewal of the church. You know, that's one of the things that the church, and we'll talk more about that here, <laughs> is in constant need of renewal. Because one of the ways you are one is if you're holy. Holiness will 
automatically lead to a certain unity. Conversion of heart. Prayer in common. Fraternal knowledge of each other. A real caring and concern for each other. Ecumenical formation of the faithful. Dialogue between different faiths and theologians. Collaboration. So there's a lot of ways in which we can try to build unity. Recognizing that probably it's going to be not happen until Jesus comes again. In terms of a perfect unity. But we're still called to work towards that. Um, and you know, this was dear to Pope John Paul. Ecumenism and working with others and trying to bring unity. He worked diligently. I felt like, you know, part of the reason he was so bent over when I'd see him in, in his older years, I just think of the weight of this not happening in his lifetime. But he started some things. You know, it took a long time for some of this separation to occur. Um, and it's going to take a while for it to, to get back. But there are things still going on that he started and initiated. So we have to have hope that that's going to occur and continue to be, make the choice to be instruments of unity. All right, holy. Any questions about that or thoughts? Anything you want to share? Anybody? Yes. And James and John were fighting, the sons of thunder were fighting with Christ. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <clears throat> and, and, you know, we, we're not going to um, paint that over in terms of this diversity because we recognize that that occurred. There's been a struggle all the time. Um, and we have to continue to struggle. And usually the point here is truth is important, but remember, truth is not without love. It's not important. It's got to have both. You must have love and truth together. So what's your motives? You know, and in this case, it's that flesh coming out and showing us that even the apostles were very real people. Jesus didn't pick the strongest, most potent folks to be his apostles. He picked folks who recognized who they were and that they were sinners and weak. Jesus said too, he said, I, I come to cast fire upon the earth. And what would I, but that it be kindled. I, I have not come to bring peace. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But in that fire and in that division is truth. Right. That's who he is. That's right. what he brought. Yeah. And we have to reconcile it within ourselves. Right. With love. So how, so, you know, that, that is clearly in there. So how do we deal with that? Well, I think, you know, the point is, is we're supposed to be focusing on Jesus. When we focus on Jesus and truth and love, there are going to be people who hate that. <clears throat> and we see that in our culture. So if you don't come under some kind of attack, then you kind of wonder what you're saying and doing. So the division is, you know, Jesus is, if we're focusing on the right things, there are going to be people who are going to see that as something they don't want to hear, the truth. And it will bring division. But we should never be focusing on wanting to be apart from them, to want to hurt them, to want to get back at them. We should be focusing on Jesus and truth and love. And, and those are the part of the mystery and tensions in the Bible in terms of what we see. The church is holy. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water, baptism with the word, that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And that's why... In the very beginning of this whole section about the marks, the catechism talks about the fact that this takes faith. Because you look at that and think, and you look around, look at me, you know, look at the members of the body of Christ and 
They don't look so holy. I mean, they're sinners. And that's who Jesus picked. You know, in terms of who to associate with. But part of this holiness is recognizing that we are sinners. That we need to repent. That we need forgiveness. And to continue to work at it. Knowing full well that if we continue to put Jesus in front of us as our model, that this can occur. And we have examples. That's why the church gives us saints to look at in terms of we can see what God has accomplished. And I, you know, I've said this about Mary being in terms of the ultimate saint. And Mary points to her son because she knows that she would not be who she is if it wasn't for what Jesus did. It's because of him that she was the saint that she was. How can any one of you with a case against another dare to bring it to the unjust for judgment instead of to the holy ones? Again, Paul keeps referring to the followers as holy ones. <coughs> Knowing full well as you read some of his letters, what is he doing? Why did he write some of his letters? He's chastising them for not being so holy. Again, mystery. It's hard to understand at times. But in faith, we accept that because we look to what will be. <clears throat> now, in regard to the collection of the holy ones, again, for our sake, he made him to be sin who did not know sin, obviously Jesus, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then John says, if we, but, and, and the catechism says this too, if we say we're without sin, we deceive ourselves. <coughs> so we work towards holiness, knowing we are sinners. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding day of the Lamb. Again, a, she was allowed to wear a bright, clean linen garment to represent the holiness that we will be. Because only in, in heaven, and that's why, you know, we won't get into discussion about that in terms of purgatory, is you've got to be holy to be in heaven. And the way that's typically explained is people can't stand to be in the presence of God with your sin and imperfection. It's like the closer you get, the more it gets magnified. And you read the saints, and they give you that image. As they got closer... I mean, they were going to practically wanting to go to confession every day, you know, for the least infraction because it gets so magnified. Did Mother Teresa, now Mother Teresa, have that same feeling almost of despair? She, she felt so, um, um, I don't know how, what's the word, uh, almost a dark night of the soul because of her relationship with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've actually done the teaching on this, but it's, it's, um, we could spend a lot of time talking about it. It's, it's more than that. It's, it's, um, there's a whole lot to that, and, and I'd be glad to talk about it at some point. But in terms of Mother Teresa, because you have to look at her vows that she took and put it into context in terms of who she, she was. Just, yeah. And um, an incredible woman, anyway. If she doesn't become a saint, I'll be shocked. <laughs> With me through the whole Old Testament, too, the Lord says, I, the Lord, make you holy. Carries it all the Exactly. Through all the New Testament, you know, saying, Peter, you can't do it without me. So we need him to be holy. If you, if you want to go back and look at Old Testament, you could say that the Old Testament is the story of this is what God wants to accomplish and cannot accomplish <laughs> in his people until this can only be accomplished because of Jesus. And it's to show us and to show the people that it can't happen without Jesus. If we try to do it on our own, it's just not going to happen. Hmm? 
The church is held as a matter of faith to be unfailingly holy in the catechism. This is because Christ, the Son of God, who with the Father and Spirit is hailed as alone holy, loved the church as his bride. Again, this image of bride, again, oneness and holiness together. It is real, though imperfect. The church was a body composed of different members. It couldn't lack the noblest of all. It must have a heart. The image here is a heart burning with love. Christ, holy, innocent, and undefiled, knew nothing of sin, but came only to expiate the sins of the people, all members of the church. By canonizing, again, saints, some of the faithful, by solemnly proclaiming that they practiced heroic virtue and lived in fidelity to God's grace, the church recognizes the power of the spirit of holiness within her and sustains the hope of believers by proposing the saints to them as models and intercessors. And they have been a source of renewal. I mean, it's not uncommon when things get really dark. The church is really becoming less and less holy <laughs> and usually less and less one that saints come about in the church to restore things. Like, why did the Pope pick St. John Vianney? Because he went to a town that was horrible, had become very dark, and yet this one priest turned it around. But of course, who turned it around? It was Christ, but he was the instrument. So are we going to be instruments? Again, we have a choice. Do we become instruments of oneness and holiness? Yes. Yes. <coughs> right, because they, people started to recognize that they weren't holy and they were sinful and they needed Jesus. Yes, and he says, um, so in terms of holiness, does anybody else have anything they want to say? Okay. All right, Catholic. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Interesting, isn't that? Then Jesus approached and said to them, all power. In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. There it is, in a nutshell. In terms of Catholic. All nations. He didn't just say to some, to have the church in this little corner. It's everywhere, to all nations. And virtually, you know, the church is in all nations. Some less than others. Some because... It's been almost wiped out. And, you know, the amazing thing when you go and you China and various places, you'll go where the church was persecuted and almost wiped out, and you go back, <clears throat> and there's this significant remnant of people who maintained an underground church that came from those original priests who went and bishops who went there. It's, a, it's pretty amazing when you go and look at that. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. And this is a part of this where it's so important undergirding this is the fact that we believe in faith that Jesus is with us. No matter how bad, no matter how dark things get, He's still with us trying to accomplish this in us. Catholic. What means universal? Mark, go into the whole world and again proclaim the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. So this is in the early church. People talk about the apostolic age, and we'll get to that in the sense of 
The apostolic age were the apostles who actually walked and talked with Jesus. And, and we'll get to that here in terms of the difference between, what's the difference between a bishop and the, an apostle? <laughs> and that's, there it is kind of in a nutshell. For God, now in Romans, God delivered all to disobedience that he might have mercy upon all. We really believe that Jesus came to save everybody. Not just some. Not a predestined few. <laughs> Jesus came for everybody. Do you know what the church, just as a sidelight in terms of predestination, because it's related to this, does the Catholic Church believe in predestination? Yes, it does. But what does it believe? It believes we were all predestined to be saved through Jesus Christ. I mean, Scripture clearly says that. This, God knew what we were going to do, because He knows everything. <coughs> so He had His plan to, to send His Son <coughs> from the very beginning of time for us, because He is without beginning. But if you say that we're all predestined to be saved in Christ, are we all saved in Christ? The church uh, does not say that, say that. The church hopes for that. Because we have free will. We, God does not take away our free will, and therefore we can choose to reject God. And, you know, John Paul II, he talked about hell, and he defined hell as a choice to separate from God. Well, the, well, no, the church says, one, the church says we can't say anybody is in hell. We can't even say Judas is in hell because the church cannot condemn anyone. Now, the church could excommunicate you and kick you out and say you've committed a mortal sin. But in the end, the church doesn't say you're going to hell. It says you could. Exactly. Jesus is the one who makes the final judgment. And this is where what Father's talking. But the church does not believe in universalism, that everybody will be saved, because Jesus clearly said there was a hell. There would be judgment. I mean, why would he have judgment if there weren't somebody who needed to be judged? So, but the church is saying the church would hope. And that's why it's our duty to spread the good news and the gospel. To give people that hope. But like I said before, is if, you know, God's throwing out the lifeline. Because Jesus isn't going to give up on any of us. But we can give up on him. And say, no, I don't want what you have. I don't want to be one with you. I don't want to be part of the body of Christ. People can make that choice. And we can't take that away from them. Otherwise, then there's not love. Because you can't have love without free will. Love means you get to choose to love somebody. If you, if you can't choose not to, then you can't choose to love. It needs to be a choice. What? what? Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm okay. Thank you. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. And while the church teaches that we have free will, we also know that that is corrupted by original sin. Yes. And that, that sometimes people make decisions, even a mass murderer, because of a mental illness or whatever. Right. And that's why suicide, the church would say, well, people, you know, some people, some people would have said way back when, if somebody committed suicide, they're going to hell. Well, church doesn't say it because mental illness and whatnot. May, you know, Judas hung himself, but what does that say about Judas? That says he recognized he did something bad. <clears throat> so we don't know. Again, you know what? I don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that in terms of judging others. But you do have to worry about 
being one holy Catholic and apostolic. That's what Jesus called us to do. We don't have to worry about judging people in the sense of whether they're going to hell or not. It's okay to judge in terms of if somebody's doing something wrong, it's very clear that they're, what they're doing is wrong or sinful. You have a duty to point that out, out of love. Not out of, I'm better than they are, or, or you know, they're a rotten, awful person, but because you care about them, not about you. So you've got to look at your motives. That's what it means to be holy, is to have pure motives in what you do. That doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. Because, you, you know, you can have good motives and still do something stupid. <laughs> <coughs> Jesus died for everybody. Yes. He, he makes redemption and salvation available to everybody. Catholic. And again, part of this, it, it is when you start thinking about this, okay. So that's why we have to turn to the church. Who's wrestled with these issues for 2,000 years. You know, when I converted, I said, well, you know, after a couple thousand years, I figure they know a little more than I do. That isn't, that isn't a real humbling statement, you know. <laughs> but, but I think that's what we have to think. And, you know, I mean, some extremely bright people, the current Pope, have thought about these things and wrestled with these things. Uh, and, and just as a side... This and I don't want to get into a big thing about it, but just to show you how the church wrestles with these things is what happens to infants who die and aren't baptized. The churches wrestle with that. The church came up with a theory of this idea of limbo, which it threw out. And, and basically they had they put all these theologians together to study it because there were two things that they said that, that Jesus said. Jesus himself said this. You must be baptized. You must be reborn of water to get into the kingdom. But he also said, I came to save all. <laughs> and so you know what they came away with? We don't have the answer. It's up to God. Did the church, did the church ever say limbo, or that was just theologians in the church? Theologians. That was not a dogma of the church. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Catholic. Sent to all nations, all countries, all races, you know, that's what the church is all about. That's what Jesus came for. Everybody. He came at first for who? I mean, he repeatedly in scriptures, he said this. He just came for the Jews, for the chosen people. The rest of you. But it's really interesting because, again, there's a tension there. Because he repeatedly says that. But who are the examples repeatedly in parables and whatnot? It was the non-Jews or the heretical Jews the Samaritans or whatever. <laughs> and I think he's presaging. He said, well, yeah, I came to save the Jews. That's who my focus is. And most of you apostles, that's who your focus needs to be. But in the wings is Paul. <laughs> Jesus found a lot of white and sepulchers, too. And that's that problem like you said that you gave them the task. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And again, I think... and that. Um, what was the story the other day? Oh, I don't, is, is it okay, Charlie, if I share a little bit? You know, well, Charlie was giving his testimony on Monday. And um, the message I always, you know, what I come away with is we can't ever give up on people. We can't just say, oh, write people off. Jesus didn't write anybody off. He wants to save everybody. But free will. Yes, corrupted free will. But see, we have to believe, and our hope is, that even though our free will is corrupted because of grace, Jesus is always throwing opportunities for grace. You can't outdo him in terms of grace and love and mercy, so he's always giving us opportunities until we die. <coughs> but we can say, eh. I want my way, because that's, you know, Adam and Eve, that's their original sin. It's my way, our way, not your way. One of the things you're talking about really are some of the great mysteries of the story. And to get back to something you just said a couple of moments ago regarding who did Jesus come to save, he came to 
say Israel, which means the chosen for themselves. So in one sense, there is a kind of predestination in that when you look at it from that context. Yes. And, and this is one of the great mysteries. And, and of course, we're surrounded throughout the faith with mystery. And that is part of the history that each of us in this room has learned to contend with. Not just the mysteries of the history, but the mysteries of day to day life. Yes. Amen. Yeah, you're going to hear me say mystery a lot because I think we need to understand that is that we cannot reduce our faith down to concrete, black and white, everything. We cannot explain every aspect of it. We do our best. That's what the church did with the creed. But you have to be careful with that. The creed is not the full explanation of God. Because you can't reduce God to words. God is infinite. But the creed helps us to understand who God is and aspects of God. But in the end, that's the personal nature of the church in terms of one holy Catholic, but it's your journey. Again, part of the mystery. Father McDonald's journey is different from mine. Mine is different even from my wife. Even though we're doing it together, her experience of God is different from mine. It's my personal journey. And that's the way it is for all of you. And so you can't, again, one holy Catholic, the church is here to help us. But it's something we can't explain every aspect of it. And it's great to me. <laughs> it's wonderful. Once you get, you surrender to that and you just participate in it, it makes the journey wonderful. I don't have to explain every little detail. And yet I'm, I tend to be a very theological, concrete, explain it kind of guy. But at the same time, I recognize, wow, I just, I can't. Well, if everything was in black and white and set up, well, you wouldn't need faith. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we, we heard a talk um, by this woman about she, her experience in Africa um, Wednesday night. And her son, did, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but her son had this horrible, they had a car accident. And her, her son was horribly brain damaged. And she was just, God came into her life. And I, I believe this was real. Like during the accident, she experienced God like she'd never experienced. She was a sitting in the pew, you know, typical Christian who went to church and thought, well, because I go to church, I'm a good Christian and did basically good things. Had not really experienced God in a personal way. Zap. So she gives her a little testimony and she's only, this has only been an on fire kind of Christian for five years. And I felt led to give her copy, or not a copy, but I mentioned, I gave her my card with the title of a book on it, Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light, because what's called the desert experience. And most Christians at some point, and that reason I bring that up is faith. If you've had experiences or things hunky-dory, you know, it's easy to walk in the faith, say I'm Catholic, Christian. But when you go through that desert experience where you feel nothing, are you still going to follow Jesus? Are you still going to try to be one holy Catholic and apostolic? And if you're growing in the faith, I promise you that will happen. Okay? Because faith, faith, faith it takes faith to get through that. It was always easy. Wouldn't take any faith. All right. Outside the church, there is no salvation. Now, how many of you heard that? I mean, you know, a lot of people who are outside the Catholic church would cringe at that. But so how can we say that? Well, we say it because 
back to this, the body of Christ. Again, part of that mystery is, well, if Christ saved us and is saving us, and the church is the body of Christ, then salvation must be coming to you through the church, right? Ultimately, though, the church is always going to point towards Jesus. Exactly, the body of Christ. Again, mystery. All right, and then because of this, because of this Catholic nature, we all have a mission. And, you know, we all think about the missionaries, and it's their job to spread the good news and to bring people into the church and make, help bring them into oneness and holiness. No, it's all of us, everybody. If you believe it's the good news, why wouldn't you want to share it? So we all have a duty to some degree. Yes, some people are called to be missionaries where that is their sole purpose in life is to convert people and bring them in. But all of us are called to spread the good news. And certainly, if we look around in our culture, there's lots of opportunities to do that. I don't know about you, but I see a lot of unhappy people. And in, in the practice of medicine, I guarantee I saw a lot of unhappy people, spiritually and emotionally. They need the healing power of Jesus. So we all need to be missions. And, you know, today, great feast day, St. Teresa, little flower, you all know about her, died at age 24 and made a doctor of the church. One of three women, 24, because she talks about the little way in terms of little ways every day to bring the good news and to be one holy with her fellow nuns, praying for them just little ways. And look what she accomplished. She, I'm sure she had no intention whatsoever of becoming a doctor of the church. But her example, because she was faithful, you know, Scripture says if you're faithful in little things, then God will give you big things. And he didn't even give her really a big thing. But in the end, the church recognized what a great gift she was because of what God did in her, and she said yes to God. Yeah. All right, apostolic. Now, the reason I, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time, and I know we want to get go and do discussions, um, this is important because who tells us you know, I mean, the apostles were witnesses. They were there with Christ. And remember, the early churches, what did they do? Is they told others about Christ. This was passed on orally at first. And then people started writing things down to remember. But initially it was passed on. And so the apostles appointed folks. <clears throat> to carry on. And, and if you go back and read, and Father's got a book, if you, this is an excellent book about the apostles. If you want to get a good picture of the apostolic nature in terms of the original apostles, who they are, um, Jesus used them because they said yes. And they were instruments, and then they passed it on because they were, if you, it's very clear in Scripture in terms of their unique nature. And if you read the scriptures, in terms of the unique nature of Peter, I mean, it's there in scripture when people want to deny him being different from the other apostles. The scriptural evidence is very clear that he was different. He was unique. 
And I would challenge you if you know if you doubt that to go look. And, and actually, I can give you all the scriptures, but not not tonight. Uh, okay, so he summoned his twelve disciples and gave them over authority over unclean. Well, in today's scripture, we talked about the seventy-two. I mean, there were a lot of followers and uh, disciples of Jesus, but he didn't name but twelve. He didn't name the seventy-two. It's the twelve that he gave names to. And he says, gave them authority over unclean spirits to dry them out and to cure every disease and every illness. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. My heavenly Father. In, in other words, Peter was given a unique grace to understand what was going on in terms of who Jesus was. But it was the Father who did that in him. And I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. Again, confirmation of the fact that the church will prevail. No matter how dark it gets, you've got to have faith. Hang in there. And there's been some pretty dark times in the history of the church. I mean, what do you think it was for those guys in... You know, in the early Roman Empire when the church was being, I mean, literally slaughtered every day. Um, John, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit because without me you can do nothing. If, in terms of the unique aspect of the apostles, if you go back and read John 14 through 17, this is that Lord's Supper. After, he's spending all this time saying all these things to the twelve. Not to the 72, not to everybody else, just to the 12. I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So they may all be one. Again, looking at that oneness, but in some degree they were unique. As you, Father, are in me and I in you. And he breathed on them. This is after he's risen. It says to them, receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. He didn't say this before to the rest of the followers. He said it to the twelve. He gave them that special apostolic grace and power to forgive sin. The Pope teaches with the bishops, the magisterium, that's Christ talking to us. Not just a bunch of men who got together and had a committee meeting. That's Christ speaking to us. And in Acts, but you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. So some of these scriptures incorporate all this. They devoted themselves. And you see the, the followers after in Acts, in terms of as the word is spreading, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life and to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And Paul says it many times. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And that's the other thing that makes them unique. And how does Paul get away with calling himself apostle? He's 13. Because he saw Jesus directly. Jesus knocked him off the horse and said, hey, what are you doing to my body? And there's another image in terms of how the body of Christ is the body. Jesus says, you're persecuting me. He didn't say you're persecuting my followers. He said, you're persecuting me. Oof. Paul got the message. Paul, an apostle, not from human beings nor through a human being, but through Jesus Christ. Paul's clearly recognized. He's not an apostle because of anything he did. In fact, he was doing, what was he doing? He's killing the Christians or the Jews who believed in Jesus. And he says he's the least of the apostles. So, I'll leave you to read the rest. Can I make a comment about what you said, that the Pope and the bishops represent Christ today, and they do. But they don't make up teachings uh, like as though... Everything that they teach, you could find in the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the Scripture. Uh, so they don't make up something new. Uh, right. They, 
emphasize what we already know and might address issues that are contemporary uh, for us and make the, the teachings of Christ applicable to a contemporary situation, but they're never going to come up with a, a new teaching. And there are certain things that the Pope can't even change. He has no authority to change if it's part of the apostolic faith. Right. Uh, so, you know, you'll see some Protestant denominations today kind of coming up with new ideas about marriage and ministry and all the rest of that. And you have to ask yourself, well, where are they getting this from? Uh, and, and they're getting it from their own ideas. Uh, Making it up as they go along. Right. Whereas in the Catholic Church, you have a, a way to prevent that from occurring because of this gift of faith or the positive faith that the Pope and the bishops are to hand on right. rather than to make up. That's what, why, and, and Pope Benedict emphasizes this over and over again, is that it, this is something that happens as the church's understanding may change in terms of expanding upon our teachings of a dogma. The dogma doesn't change, but our understanding of it can change but it, it all ha should tie back, all the way back. It shouldn't be contradictory. And that's the great beauty of tradition. It allows you to understand what's going on now based on what we know from the past. But it can't break tradition. So it should be, as the, the Pope talks about it, an organic change, even the mass organically changing, because it's living. The body of Christ is living. So we respond to changes in terms of, okay, how do our teachings, our dogma, apply to birth control pills, uh, euthanasia in terms of medical advances and whatnot, stem cell research? And who's, who's supposed to figure that out? Well, again, we said, back to what Jesus said about the church will prevail. Well, how's it going to prevail? Unless he's given somebody the responsibility to make sure that it does. On earth, because he said, you know, until the second coming, it's up to his followers to carry on. He's not going to come down in the flesh, in his transformed self, to do it until the second coming. Because he expects us to live a life of faith and have faith that he is working through the bishops and the Pope together. Anybody? Jerry? God knew the past. He knew the present. And he knew the future. Yeah, amen. And he made provision. Yep. Right, yes, yes. You know, and that would go back to what we were talking about earlier. Well, it goes back to what I was saying earlier in terms of the fact that everybody who is baptized and believes in Jesus, you know, really is part of this in terms of Catholic little c being universal. But, but see, you know, we're saying, hey, well, if you're part of the body of Christ, then you, you're even part of us to some degree, imperfectly, okay, and, you know. And, and, you know, in, when the church says that, that's why dialogue, you know, it says in there has to be gentle and kind and loving, is because, you know, we're not going to condemn people for what happened in 1500 and say you're a bad, awful person because you're a Lutheran or Episcopal or whatever. Um, but we're challenging you a little bit here in terms of you're, we're trying to help you understand the fullness of the truth. And that's part of our duty.